Well, good afternoon. Happy Holy Day. Welcome to the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Thank you for all of y'all that are here. And yes, we're doing the social distancing. We're less than 10 and all of that kind of good stuff. But we are here so that we can serve others of you on the phone and the internet. Welcome to our services today. And good for you to be here. Good for us that you're here. And we're happy that you're here. So God bless you. Uh, we're going to read uh, as we typically do, and then I'm going to make an announcement right after we do our reading today. So if you would all please, uh, here we can do a hand up, but those of you on the phone, internet, grab your Bibles and open with us. Maybe you already know these verses anyway, that could be a good thing. But if you would all please stand and join us, and we're going to read from Leviticus 23, verses 4 through 8. Leviticus 23 verses four through eight. Join with us in verse eight. These are the feast of the Lord, even holy convocations, which you shall proclaim in their seasons. And the 14th day of the first month that even is the Lord's Passover. On the 15th day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread unto the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. And the first day you shall have a holy convocation, you shall do no servile work therein, but you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord seven days. And the seventh day is a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work. And so we're following the instructions as we see it, as we understand it. So anyway, um, you can uh, remain standing. You can sit back down or whatever, because I'm going to take about a minute and make an announcement. We have typically in the past several years throughout the feast on days when it's not a holy day, on the days that it's not the weekly Sabbath, we have offered in the evenings a Bible study. We're going to do that again. And so uh, the first one will be Friday evening. And this year, the way it works out, there will be four. One will be on Friday evening. The next one will be on Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. All of them would begin at 7 p.m. Uh, our time, Eastern Daylight Time. So those are the plans. And so we'll try to send out a, 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 an email to everyone tomorrow, letting you know, remind you of this. But anyway, this is what we're planning. So remain standing. We'll go right into our song services for this holy day, first day of Unleavened Bread, our song leader today, Mr. Ian French. Happy holy day. God bless you all. Hello and happy Holy Day to everyone out there. If we could all begin by opening up our hymnals to page 11, we will start with Proclaim Holy Convocations, page 11. Show it. 
you and your seed might live. For our second hymn, if we could turn over to page 108, we will sing Holy Mighty Majesty, page 108. third hymn turn over to page 88 thou shepherd that dost israel keep after which we'll have the opening prayer brought to us by mr tracy french page 88 remain standing for the opening prayer by Mr. Tracy French. Let us pray. Our gracious, merciful, loving Father in heaven, Abba Father, we are so very thankful to be able to assemble before your presence on this annual holy day of the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. We are thankful for the recent blessings of the Passover service. We're thankful for the fellowship that we could enjoy at the night to be much observed. And we're thankful now that we can acknowledge 
your plan of salvation for seven days and acknowledge the perfect life and the death of our Savior Jesus to redeem us and pay for our sins and the sins of humanity. We're thankful that we can acknowledge his resurrection to be your firstborn son, his appearance before you to be accepted on our behalf, and now his life to be our mediator, our high priest, the one who is the captain of our salvation, leading us day by day to your soon coming kingdom and eternal life in your family forever. And we pray that you would help us to be mindful of all these things during the Feast of Unleavened Bread and to really rejoice and have spirits rejoicing before you each day for this wonderful time that we can experience and share with others as well. We pray now that you'd inspire the speaking and the hearing and open up our hearts and minds to receive your words of truth. And again, help us to always be thankful for what you and our Lord and Savior Jesus are doing for us. And in Jesus' holy name, we praise you and thank you and ask all these things. Amen. Our first message today will be an offertory brought to us by Mr. Tony Morelli. Happy Holy Day, everybody. <clears throat> Welcome to the first day of Unleavened Bread in 2020. <clears throat> Before we start the offertory sermonette, I want to have a little advertisement. We're streaming the video today different, differently than we normally do. So what you can do to see a clearer video and um, a clearer video and see the video go on your computer if you go to cotsg.org and on the front page just go down toward the bottom and you'll see a, a video area you should just be able to click it and it'll start playing we're streaming live to YouTube and hopefully we're going to continue that from now on, although we may be using different uh, methods in the coming little bit. Today is the first day of unleavened bread, and I'm going to take you on a journey into the past. Two pasts, as a matter of fact. So let's start, let's start with Jesus and the apostles on the night of unleavened bread, excuse me, the night of unleavened bread, on the night of pass, their la the last Passover. And the apostles were listening to Jesus as he was, as he did the foot washing, and then he did the wine, the bread and the wine. And then he starts giving them his last set of instructions. Now, the apostles and Jesus, you know, they were quite accustomed to that time frame. So what you need to do is kind of remove your thoughts of what you think about what was happening based on what you know in 2020. Go back to 30 AD or whatever year it was that Jesus had this final Passover. You're an apostle, you're Jewish, you grew up being Jewish, you grew up having what's called today is the Seder meal. You grew up thinking when the Messiah comes, he's not, if he is gonna be a, hum, a person, he's going to save Israel out of being ruled over by foreign nations. 
And Jesus was trying to prepare them that he was going to die. And even though they heard him talking about these things, they didn't understand it. They, it was like, no, you've got it all wrong. Or, you know, I don't get this. And then later on that night, he was captured. All the apostles basically left him. And later on, on Passover day, he was killed. And so they were really shaken up. Even though he'd warned them, they were shaken up. How can the Messiah be dead? And then after three and a half days after Unleavened Bread started, when he was resurrected and they saw him, they still, they still had problems grasping what was going on. I mean, if you were and I were there, we would have problems grasping what happened as well. We would, you know, here's somebody we lived with for three and a half years, and now he, he was dead, and now he's alive, and, we, and he's different than when we saw him. And we're saying, okay, when are you going to get rid of the Roman government? When are you going to, you know, save Israel? And we know this because on Acts, in Acts 1, in verse 6, when he, got, when he got them all together and he was heading up, the apostles went, said to him and asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Forty days after Jesus was here, that's what they were thinking. Now, another question I have for you is this. The apostles that were there, were they there because <clears throat> they told Jesus they were going to be there? Were they there because, you know, they were, they were special people in Israel at that time? No. Actually, they were there because Jesus had picked them three and a half years earlier. Jesus chose them, and then they were there, and they were able to partake in this history. So it wasn't, <clears throat> so what I guess, one of the things I'm trying to say, it wasn't because there was something special about them, that they were more righteous than anybody else in Israel. It was that God chose them. In fact, in John, <clears throat> in John 6, in 44, Christ told them while, during his ministry, no, <clears throat> excuse me, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him on the last day. And in 65, he kind of repeats it again. Therefore, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by the Father. And then several chapters later in John 14, 6, Jesus said, well, on the last night that he was with them, he says, as a human, that is. The last night he was with them as a human. Jesus said to him, I said, said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Pretty amazing statements. <clears throat> so let's now travel back. 15 or 1500 years where Moses was talking to God. So go to Exodus 6, verse 3. <clears throat> I'd like to recount some things. They talked to the Israelites and God is 
getting them prepared. But God is also reminding Moses, he said, tells Moses, I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, Lord, which wasn't, I was not known to them. I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, which they were strangers. And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. Now, let's have a little inset right here. Moses is about 80 years old at this point in time. 40 years before this, he killed an Egyptian, thinking that he was possibly thinking he was going to save Israel himself. And we know, if we go back even 40 more years where Moses was born, we know the Egyptians were killing male babies. So we know for a period of 80 years, and we know it happened before that as well, but for a period of 80 years, in Moses' lifetime, Israel was in subjugation as slaves, doing hard labor. I can't imagine doing hard labor for a week. How would you like to be 80 years old and that's all you've known? Or even 40 years old and that's all you've known. And that's where these people were. That's all they knew was being a slave to the Egyptians. But they knew something about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. How much, we don't know. but they knew enough to call on God. And he says, and in verse six, therefore say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. Then in verse seven, he says, I will take you as my people. I will be your God. <clears throat> then you shall know that I am the Lord, your God, who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will bring you into the land which I swore to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I will give it to you <clears throat> as a heritage. I am the Lord. So, was it the Israelites that chose God, or was it God who chose the Israelites? He gave them the invitation. He said, I choose you as a nation. <clears throat> and as we know, they didn't have any particular reason of righteousness that God chose them. The reason he chose them was because of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, a covenant that he made with their forefathers. But God <clears throat> said he was going to do something with them, just as God said <clears throat> to us who keep the Passover today and unleavened bread today, he will do something with us. We're not here because of what we do. We're here because of what God has done for us. And here he was trying to establish a relationship with Israel, just as he's trying to establish a relationship with us. Do we take that seriously? Think about it. The Israelites were led by God out of Egypt. Here they were, you know, on the last day we'll see, they were between the Egyptians and a great sea, great water. Who in the right mind, if you were a man, would bring a people there? You have nowhere to go. You can't escape. But God had a reason. Verse 
<clears throat> God gives us various things in our life we don't understand, but God has a reason. It's the same thing. Do you have a relationship with God? In the apostles' time, he, they had a relationship with him. They didn't understand it until they received the Holy Spirit in, on Pentecost. God has given us his Holy Spirit so that we can continue to grow his relationship with him now. We have a very special relationship with God. <clears throat> These spring holy days show us through God's plan how that relationship works. And if you follow the plan, it shows what happens. The relation, not the relationship and the outcome, but the ideas of the relationship with God. How important is that to you? And this is just day one of the days of unleavened bread. Because God is leading us <clears throat> and he's not going to stop leading us. It's more of, are we gonna stop letting God lead us or not believe God? So today is the first day of unleavened bread. <clears throat> And on the holy days, God is set apart special duties that we're supposed to do. In Deuteronomy 16, in verse 16, he says, three times a year, all your males will appear before the Lord your God in a place which he chooses, at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, at the Feast of Weeks, and at the Feast of Tabernacles. And they shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. And every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessing of the Lord your God, which he has given you. God has blessed us with his truth. <clears throat> God has blessed us with our lives. God has blessed us with our health. God has blessed us that we have brothers and sisters and many more things because we can look to God. God has given us many blessings. So the offertory, the offertory music <clears throat> today will be a piano solo. And the name of the song will be I'll Never Leave You.
Everyone could please rise one more time and open up to page 146. We will sing Praise God's Name, page number 146. For the sermon today, our pastor, Mr. Ben Faulkner. Could we maybe back this up just a little, just like right in my yep. noops. <laughs> That's good. Okay. Thank you. Wow. Brethren, here we are finally arriving at the Feast of God. Another, another year, another special holy time the first day of unleavened bread. And you think about it, knowing all the things, all the different symbolisms that are there, and some we'll talk about, and so many we're not going to talk about all of them, but with all of that, what we know about the days of unleavened bread. Let me begin by asking each one of us a question. Could we be entering into these days of unleavened bread and be spiritually unleavened? I mean... We've been preparing for the Passover and for the days of unleavened bread, and it goes back for weeks and weeks. And then we've been busily getting all the, the physical leavening out of our houses, our cars, our workspaces, wherever it may have been. And we finally arrived. And so we still ask, are we spiritually prepared and ready? Now, with this in mind, with this question in mind and setting this tone with this in mind, I'd like for us to consider some different statements that I think all of us know and all of us realize to be true from the Word of God. And so let's take a look at some of these things. The first one is, this present world is an evil world. 1 John 5, verse 19. 1 John 5, 19, I'll read this out of the NIV. We know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. Now, John is saying the whole world is. Do we know this? Do we realize this? As we think about this, this world has been deceived by Satan. 
Revelation 12, 9. Revelation 12, 9, and the great dragon was cast out that old servant called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. And he was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. The second statement that we all know was true, we want to mention is this world is going to pass away. 1 John 2, verse 15. 1 John 2, verse 15. Love not the world neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That is a shocking statement for a believer to take a look. Not that it's true or not true. It's the fact that, is he talking to me? Would, I, would this verse be true in my life? Is this, is this true in your life? The next verse, 16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world, and the world passes away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abides forever. Do you understand that this is actually a major theme of the Days of Unleavened Bread? Now, we don't focus on it in that way, but this is a major theme. Then the next point that I want to mention is Jesus is going to destroy every facet of this present evil world when he returns. Revelation 18. Revelation 18. Verse 1. Uh, if you're doing notes, put in your notes Revelation 18, 1 through 24. I'm not going to read all of those verses but I'd like you to have it in your notes, but we're going to read some of them. Verse 1, Revelation 18 in verse 1. And after those things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having a great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of demons. It says devils are demons. And the whole of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. He's describing the world. And all of these, these birds and all of this is talking of symbolisms of things that are going on in the world. Rulership and governments and all of that. Go on to, to uh, drop down to verse 20. Rejoice over her, you heaven, and you holy apostles and prophets. For God has avenged you of on her. And a mighty angel took a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea. Thus, with violence shall all that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. And the voice of harpers and musicians and of pipers and the trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in you. And no craftsman of whatever craft he be, shall be found no more in you, and the sound of a millstone shall be heard no more at all in you, and the light of the candle shall shine no more at all in you, and the voice of the bridegroom and the bride shall be heard no more at all in you. For your merchants were the great men of the earth, and by your sorceries were all nations deceived." And in her was found the blood of the prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. Our world, if you really, if you take a look at it and you really stop and think about it, we could read headlines in the world other than the fact that we only have one headline in the, going on in the world today, of course. But this world has become as one. And I mean by that has become like a society that deserves to be destroyed. And the reason is, is because man in his heart has become a people who hate God. And as we know, Satan is to be blamed for all of this. Revelation 12, 9, we read it, deceives the whole world. But I want you also to go now with me to John 15, beginning in verse 18. John 15, verse 18. If the world hate you, know, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. 
Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If you have kept my sayings, they will also keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. They don't know God. Now, I know we can stop and we can say, yes, but God blinded their eyes. That's a totally different subject, but it is that part is true. But who he blinded, of course, was Israel because they were offered the truth and they went, no, we don't want to look at it. We don't want to see it. So God blinded their eyes because they can't see it. we we'll go on. If I had not come and spoken unto you, they had not had sin. But now they have no cloak. There is no excuse for their sin. That's what this is saying. They have no excuse. He that hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin. But now have they both seen and hated both me and my father. But this comes to pass, that the word might be fulfilled, which is written in, in their law. They hated me without a cause. And he's quoting, he said, and it was written, and it, was, and it comes out of Psalm 35, verse 19. And then it's repeated similarly, but it's also repeated in Psalm 69 in verse 4. I want to give you the title. I have entitled this message, Resisting Spiritual Leaven. Resisting spiritual leaven. So here today on this first day of unleavened bread, this is this world. This is what we see around us. This evil world that's going to be passing away. They don't know it. They think it's going to last forever. We got all of these various things that are coming to that are coming around. They're warnings. They're warnings. I want to. I want. I want to. I wasn't sure that I'd read this. I have this, but I want to read. I want to read this to you. Uh, Someone sent this to me uh, through an email, and this is from Tuesday's, this week, Tuesday's Tampa Bay Times newspaper. I don't know if any of you read this, but they sent it to me, and it's a direct quote right out of the newspaper. I'm going to read it just like it says. Here. The rest of this is all a quote. I'll tell you when it ends. Word up. Can you handle the truth, my brother? Only love. <clears throat> In three, short, in three short months, just as he did with the plagues of Egypt, God had taken away everything we worship. <clears throat> God said, you want to worship athletes? I will shut down the stadiums. You want to worship musicians? I will shut down the civic centers. You want to worship actors? I will shut down the theaters. You want to worship money? I will shut down, shut down the economy and collapse the stock market. You don't, want, <clears throat> you don't want to go to church and worship me? I will make you where you can't go to church. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Maybe we don't need a vaccine. <clears throat> Maybe we need to take this time of isolation from the distractions of the world and have a personal revival where we focus on the only thing in the world that really matters, Jesus, end quote. This was written and sent to the Tampa Bay Times by, by Terry Balea, better known as Hulk Hogan. Yeah, I was shocked. I was shocked. But I think he said it right on the nail. That's, that's the message. That is the message. That's the days of unleavened bread. 
You don't want to worship me? He gives us a way of doing these things to, to be away from this. And as I said, this is what we see around us today. So the thing is, what we need to realize and concentrate on and think about, brother, what we, what we need to know, the world doesn't know that, and that is it did not have to be this way. I mean, after all, our awesome and loving God, who is generous and loving and merciful and kind God, did not want it to be that way. Now, he knew it was going to be this way, but is that what he wanted? No, no. I mean, just think about it. Remember when God created the heavens and the earth, he said, and it was good. That was in Genesis 1 and verse 4, and we know the stories there. And then he went through every one of the things until he came down in and created man. And he says, and it was very good. And it was very good. Then, for a very short period of time, this first man and woman on the earth, husband and his wife and God dwelt together in total peace and harmony. Go with me to Genesis chapter 2. Uh, in your notes, put down Genesis 2, verse 1 through 19. We're not going to read all of that, but that's the gist of the story, what we're seeing. But in verse 1, And the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts thereof. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the Sabbath day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the Sabbath day and sanctified it, because that in he rested from all his work which he created and made. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Now, let's move forward and go down to verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the earth and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man where he had formed him. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to sight and is good for food, the tree life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Verse 15, we're not reading it all. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden in Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat thereof, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat of it. For in the day that you eat thereof you shall surely die. And the Lord said, It is not good that a man should be alone. I will make him a helpmate for him. And out of the ground formed every beast of the field and every fowl in the air and brought unto Adam to give to see what he would call them, and whatsoever Adam called them, every living creature, that was the name thereof. And I'm not going to read you, but you can keep reading and on down in verse, all the way down to verse 28. In verses 21 through 28, it goes and he says, Then God gave Adam a wife. And the Hebrew, the sense of the Hebrew there is, is God built him a wife. That's that's the Hebrew. And and he called her Eve, the mother of all living. Then while in the garden, this husband and wife, this couple, they were living an ideal life in a perfect world. And then man decided to sin. Chapter 3, Genesis 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, this is Satan, the devil, the serpent, saying to Eve, the woman. Uh, and he said unto her, yea, has God said, you shall not eat of every tree in the garden? And the woman said unto the garden, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the tree uh, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto her, the woman, you shall not surely die. Lie, lie, lie. 
For God knows that in the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes will be opened and you shall be as God's knowing good and evil. And that's exactly what man decided to do, that they would decide what is good and what is evil. And you know the story, you know this. And they took of the fruit thereof and the eyes of both, this is down in verse seven, over them were open and, and they knew that they were naked. Really? It's interesting. And they sewed fig trees together and made themselves apron. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees in the garden. Wow. Wow. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto, Where are you? And Adam said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And this verse 11 is, is one of these aha moments, if you really think about it, what is actually being said. And he, God said, Who told you that you were naked? A lot of symbolism there. Not going through it here. I'm just saying it's a whole lot of symbolism here. And then God asked, have you eaten of the tree whereof I commanded you that you should not eat? Man, and I'm using man as husband and wife here, mankind, and I'm Adam and Eve for representation of all of mankind that followed. We know that from all kinds of scriptures. But man became afraid of God because he decided to sin and he decided to sin and, it, and he became afraid of God because disbelieving and rejecting God and then by deciding for himself this is right and this is wrong. I will decide what is right and what is wrong, as opposed to God telling us, this is the way, walk you in it. Now, does God have the right to tell us this is what this is the way to walk you in it? Yeah, yeah, I think he knows. But man decided for themselves, and this is exactly what it has been all the way down since then, down to the day, and that's why we have this present even, evil world that we're told to come out of. So we ask, I believe, a very interesting question. Why did they choose to sin? I know we could say, well, well, she was deceived, and, you know, and Adam and da, 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 okay, but no. Why did they choose to sin? And then... Another question that I think is even more interesting to ask is when we get right down to it, we need to ask, why do we sin? Go with me to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. 1 John 1, verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Sermon in itself. Verse 9, very next word. If we confess our sins, he, God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The theme of unleavened bread. Verse 10, next verse. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him, we make God a liar, and his word is not in us. So I really think that if you really think about it, what we can see is the main reason we sin, the main reason they sin, and the main reason we sin is because we are not godly. In other words, we are not living by the, by the life the way that God has instructed us and told us as a loving, merciful parent, this is the way I want you to live life. And we go, nah, I don't think I want to do it that way. We sin because of lacking the love of the truth. Now, I, go, I know some people are going to say, no, I love the truth. Then why do you sin? I mean, Jesus told us in John 14 in verse 15, he tells us and he said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. The, what is being inferred there, if we don't keep his commandments, we don't love him. 
Meaning we don't love the truth. So why do we sin? Because we don't really love the truth. We're not really godly. So it's a circle that goes back and forth. But this is what it is. Man, mankind, all of us, men, man and woman, all of us, we want to feel the fleeting, deceitful pleasure of sin. We want to experience that. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 10. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, not them that live, but perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Because we've not received the love of the truth. And therefore, we, man, are going to perish. Because you see, brethren, Satan has deceived every man, woman, and child into believing that sin is our friend. Friend, it's not an enemy. It's a friend. And anytime any one of us, especially as believers, anytime any one of us come up against a situation where we have to decide we will do right or wrong, if, if, we really think about it, and if we really take a look at it, sin is always presented to us as the easier choice. It's the resisting that's hard. The doing evil is easy. We just do. If you would, please with, go with me now to Deuteronomy chapter 12. Deuteronomy 12 and verse 6. I mean 8. Deuteronomy 12 verse 8. You shall not do after all the things that we do here this day. Every man whatsoever is right in his own eyes. It's all the way back there with Israel. Being delivered out. Same story. Every man wanted to do what was right in their own eyes. Come, come down to... Proverbs 14, 12. You know this, Proverbs 14, 12. There is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Then Proverbs 21 and verse 2. Proverbs 21, verse 2. Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord ponders the heart. It really is saying is he knows. He didn't have to ponder it and think about it. He knows. This is what man has chosen to do. So we ask, why is that? Why is that? I mean, is it because sin is all around us? Or is it because sinful ways of thinking are all around us? Now, I know you could say, well, that's kind of like the same thing. Well, yeah, sort of, kind of, but not really. Just because sin is out there doesn't mean that I'm going to be thinking about it. And you know, brethren, even as believers, if we are not careful, the sinful choice can be presented to us as the right choice. Deception entered into the world. And ever since, in the garden, ever since, mankind has chosen for himself what is right and what is wrong. Paul tells us in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 7, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Because man chooses sin. Now, with this in mind, I want us to take a look at an example of a congregation in the New Testament, the Church of God in Galatia. And what we're going to see is, is how this was affecting them. They're choosing what is right and what is wrong. It's, it goes right along with this. So go with me to Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1, and we're going to read these verses through the uh, New International Version, the NIV. Galatians 5 verse 1. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. Theme of unleavened bread. 
Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Now, don't anyone get off base here and thinking there's anything. It's not a question here. It's not the question of is it right or wrong to be physically circumcised or any of that. That's not the point here. He's talking about spiritual issues here. And he's taking a look at this. And so we're going to look at it too. Verse 3. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. He's talking about if you think that the only way that you're going to be in the kingdom, the way you're going to be saved is through this act of physical circumcision, which is what the, the Jews of that day were teaching, and Paul was having to dress with it. It's not, not really in itself is not what I'm getting at. It's the fact is, is we're going to see very clear they were having problems within the church of God because some were saying this is right and this is wrong. Others were saying, no, this is right and this is wrong. And this is what he said, let's not do that. And it's just a real clear example. And it's, again, it's a major theme from the days of unleavened bread. So let's go on. Verse 4. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. In other words, you think you're going to be saved because you're being circumcised. You're alienated from Christ. Verse 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. Because he's talking about spiritually speaking for salvation. Yeah, there are physical benefits from being circumcised. Now, that's again, that's another topic. Continuing on, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. You are running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who called you. A little leaven in the NIV says, a little leaven works through the whole batch of dough, or a little leaven leavens the whole lump. The Galatians, here's the point, the Galatians were being deceived on the issue of circumcision. Salvation is needed for salvation. Others were saying, no, it's not. Now, my point here is not to say which one was right and which one was wrong. That's not my point. I'm showing this as an illustration that there were people who were deciding this is right and this is wrong, and the others were saying, no, this is right and this is wrong. And what we're seeing here in this question that Paul asked, you were, you were running a good race, and so who, who cut in on you and caused you, these first, caused you these problems? It wasn't the one who has called you. Satan was using someone, don't know that it ever is mentioned who it was, but to come against this congregation, and this was causing them to argue among themselves as to what was truth about circumcision, about what is truth and what is not truth about, is, is it needed for salvation? Yes, it is. No, it's not. They're trying to decide. And Paul is addressing them and saying, you already know this. We've already gone through this. We've already told you this. Who's getting in there? Well, who's getting in there? It's Satan. Satan was getting in there. Now, he was working through, a, through people, of course. Paul here used the analogy of a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And so what we understand is if Satan can effectively get a congregation to argue among themselves, I'm right and you're wrong, you're right and I'm wrong, that kind of thing, then he knows that he can destroy the congregation. I can go through illustrations. We have Church of God groups that have splintered and splintered and splintered because this is right and this is wrong. Others in the same group are saying, nope, this is right and this is wrong, over things probably that really made no difference. But there are splits, and then there are splits from splits. Okay. What it takes, brethren, is it takes people exhibiting the fruits of the Spirit by putting down the works of the flesh to build up a, a strong church, a strong body, a strong congregation that Satan 
cannot affect and cannot destroy. And the only way you can really do that is to keep our word, our face, our eyes in the Bible and living by every word of God. That's what Jesus said. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. He tells us the answer. He tells us the answer. That is why, at least this is a, I, th I think at least a, one of the major reasons to God in his unlimited wisdom has put as part of his plan of salvation for all of mankind, seven days of unleavened bread. It takes us that long to really get it, to really let it sink in. And we do this, and he gives this to us, and we do this every year, every year, every year. And some of us have been doing this for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 plus years. And we need it every year. We learn different things. Hopefully we learn everything every, every year. It is evident, at least it is to me in my reading this, that the Galatian brethren kept the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Otherwise, for Paul to have used the, the, the spiritual example of a little leaven leavens the whole lot would have made no sense to them. But it's in the context. They were keeping it. They were, they at least, kept, I'm not saying that when this was written, they were doing the days of Adam. That's not clear. It is also clear that yet obviously, however, they were not using these days wisely as they should, since Paul was having to warn them not to bite and devour one another. That's what he says in verse 15. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. Is that exactly what Satan was trying to do? Of course it was. Of course it was. It's also obvious that they were not coming out of sin or allowing God to deliver them out of sin. They were remaining in their sins, just like the Israelites wanted to go back into Egypt. Verse 20. In verse 20, we see the reason that Paul was writing this letter. The reason is, is it makes it plain, is because he began to doubt their, their conversion and their loyalty to Jesus Christ, the head of the church. Verse 20, New NIV, and he, and he lists these things out here. Idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, fractions or, you know, or splits, schisms, or whatever different word the different translations use. And this is what they were doing. This is happening among the, the members of the body of Jesus Christ in this congregation. And we can learn from this. And it's connected to the Days of Unleavened Bread. Now, with that in mind, I want you to go with me to Leviticus 23. Leviticus 23, verse 4. These are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations, which you shall proclaim in their seasons. And the 14th day of the first month, that even as the Lord's Passover, on the 15th day of the same month, is the Feast of Unleavened Bread unto the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. You know these verses, but we're reading them because it's during the days of unleavened bread. And the first day you shall have a holy convocation, that be today. And you shall do no servile work therein, but you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord seven days. Huh. Interesting. An offering made by fire seven days. The sense is, all seven days. So we're to be marking these days. There's no question. How do you do how do you give an offering to the Lord each day if you're not marking the days? Another topic. In the seventh day shall be a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work day in. So for seven, seven days, we are to come before God, and we're to come before God in a manner that is acceptable to hell, not what we decide is right, but what God has declared is right. This comes back to that. Are we deciding what is right and wrong? And the answer is, yes, we tend to do that. God says, eh, don't do that. 
so I think it's needless to say, but I'm going to say it anyway, and that is our offering needs to be perfect, just like the offering that the Israelites brought before God had to be perfect. In other words, had to be acceptable to him. It's not what the offering is, it's the the how we present it. Is it just, oh, this is just anything that God wants? Do we give him just this little bit of time? No, we give seven days to him, recognizing these days. There's only two holy days, but all days are days of God. I want to point out to us here something very interesting. The Hebrew word that is used here in verse 6 for unleavened bread. It's the bread, it's the word that we use, it's a, it's a word that we call matzo. It's what we use for the Passover because it's unleavened. It's a little first grader Jewish girl goes to school and they say, well, what do you eat during unleavened bread? And it says, oh, we eat bread with no, with no ingredients. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, that's the way we kind of look at it. It ah, this stuff again, yeah, okay. Well, listen to what this is actually saying. Because this is the sense of what this word is actually telling us in the Hebrew. The sense of it is greatly devouring for sweetness. What that is telling us is it is sweetness or sweet. This unleavened bread, this matzo, that's what the word in Hebrew would be. That's not the Hebrew word, but it's where we get our word matzo. That is to be sweet bread to us. No, this is just this flat, you know, a flat bread, no ingredients. It's like cardboard. We're missing the point of what he's telling us here. It's a major lesson, I think. It, what it is saying is that it is not soured or bittered with yeast. Now, that should just run up all kinds of red flags. On it. Oh, my whole attitude and how I've been eating unleavened bread is not right with God. We eat it because, well, he said we have to do it every day, and so I'm eating it, but there is no but. There is no but. It's not about the eating it. It's about what is the attitude toward the eating it. So what I'm getting at, in other words, this word can be defined or could be translated as sweet bread. Now, that's interesting. I've been doing this many, many years, and I've heard all kinds of complaints about, do I have to eat this cardboard every day and all that kind of stuff? So what we're seeing is that at least spiritually speaking, God commands us to be without sin in order that we can offer the spiritual equivalency of a physical offering made by fire, and we're to do it every day. Obviously, during these seven days of unleavened bread, we are to learn to completely reject the way of sin. I mean, after all, the sense is that sin is to be sour or bitter to us. And for some reason, God knew that it's going to take us seven days of doing this. You know, in the Passover, it represents Jesus' body. He, what, you know, we, eat it, we don't even think about, oh, this is flat bread. No, we think about this is, the, this is the body of Jesus Christ. And we're eating it because of what he did. Yeah. And so he gives us seven days to get it right in our head with our attitudes toward it. So therefore, while we're eating the sweet bread, we are to be learning that by taking it into us, by internalizing it, eating it, it is showing us that we are to be physically without leavening. Therefore, we must become sinless. That's what it's picturing. That's what it's picturing. Spiritually unleavened, or yeah, spiritually unleavened, sinless. And the reason is, is so that we can perceive how and why sin has become our enemy and it's not our friend. 
So we just go back and re-ask the question. So why do we sin? Because we aren't seeing it God's way. We're choosing our way. We're doing like Adam and Eve. We're deciding right and wrong. I decide what is right and what is wrong for me. Eh, not so much. Not if we're going to be on the page where God is. So therefore, sin is no longer to be the way that we choose to live, which is what Adam and Eve did. They chose to sin, and that's what we do. Therefore, it should never be this way ever again that we would choose to live that way. And so for these seven days, we're acting it out. We're getting into our mind, the mindset of what God wants us to have before us, what we have before him, presenting ourselves every day as we're eating this sweet bread because leaven and the context represents sin and it's bitter to us during these days. This is when we are resisting spiritual leavening. Now, I want to go through a time, through some scriptures, a time back when Israel actually got together to keep the Passover in the days of unleavened bread. And we can see some real major examples of this. And we can see the blessings that they received as a result of their doing it. Second Chronicles 30 verse 1 through 27, not going to read all of those. But I would recommend that you might want to read the whole story. We're just going to read bits and pieces of it. Second Chronicles 30, beginning in verse 1. And Hezekiah, king, sent to all Israel and Judah and wrote letters also to Ephraim and Manasseh that they should come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem to keep the Passover unto the Lord God of Israel. For the king had taken counsel in his, pre, in his uh, princes, and all the congregation in Jerusalem kept the Passover in the second month. We have to keep reading to see why did they do this. What we see is Hezekiah, the king, was trying to get Israel and Judah back on track. It's a great story. It's a great story. So let's read some more of it. Verse 3. For they could not keep it at that time because the priest had not sanctified themselves sufficiently, neither had the people gathered themselves together at Jerusalem. And at that time, what he's talking about, the time for the first Passover. The priests were not ready. They were not sanctified because there's there are I'm going to say rules, you can call them laws, that the priests were to do before the Passover. And what this is saying is they hadn't done it. But also the people hadn't even gathered themselves to keep it in Jerusalem. So neither one, no, nobody was doing it correctly. They were not doing it. So here's Hezekiah trying to get them back on track. And the thing pleased the king and all the congregation so they established a decree to make proclamation throughout all Israel. And he goes on and he says all of these things and to the end. And then and, uh, that they should come to keep the Passover unto they had not done it for a long time and such a short as was written. In other words, they had not been doing the way it was written down for them to do. They weren't doing it. But now they're trying to get back on track, and God did make provisions for the second Passover. And so anyway, let's go down, go over to verse 13. And there assembled at Jerusalem much people to, to keep the Feast of Unleavened Bread in the second month, a very great congregation. So they kept the Passover, and now they're also keeping the Days of Unleavened Bread, trying to get them back on track because they were not doing it right before. And there arose and took away the altars that were in Jerusalem and all the altars from the incense took they away and cast them into the book Kidron. We could read this, this editorial that I read just a few moments ago right here. It's shutting down all these idols. 
I think this is a real good place for us to think about that. Verse 15. And they killed the Passover on the 14th day of the second month, and the priests and the Levites were ashamed and sanctified themselves and brought into the burnt offerings unto the house of the Lord. And they stood in the place after their manner. In other words, it was written down, this is the way you're supposed to do it, priests, and so they were doing it the way that it was written, and they were doing it correctly. That is what this is saying. According to the law of Moses, the man of God, the priests sprinkled the blood which they had received from the hand of the Levites. For there were many in the congregation that were not sanctified. Therefore, the Levi had the charge of the killing of the Passovers, meaning the lambs, for everyone that was not clean to sanctify them unto the Lord. Now, the problem here, what they're doing is an awesome thing. They're trying to get Israel and Judah back on track with God. Then somewhere down the line, they kind of got off track and started deciding for themselves, we'll do it, we'll decide what is right and wrong. Because what they're saying is the people were to be doing it in you know, individual families or the next door neighbor that's, that's a believer were to be getting together that way. And they wasn't doing that. So they brought them here together, everybody doing it at one time. So the Jews kind of adopted this and said, aha, that's why we'll do it at the temple from now on. That's why on the night of the Passover, some people obviously had been doing it the right way, including Jesus and apparently the disciples. Because when Jesus told Peter and John to go and prepare the Passover, they didn't say, when? What are you talking about? It's done at the temple, you know, on the afternoon of the, of the 15th. That's not what they said. And they said, where do you want us to do it? He said, watch this man go in and da-da and all of that. And they went and prepared the Passover. It wasn't unusual. This wasn't unusual. They were still doing it. There were some that were still doing it in families like it had been told to do. They had brought this over. The Jews, the priests had brought it over, and now they were doing it at the temple. They had decided for themselves, this is the way we need to continue to do it. It's not what God had said. Anyway, it's another issue. Verse 18, for a multitude of the people, even unto and prime, it goes down all these names. But Hezekiah prayed prayed for them. Some of them were not cleansed. And Hezekiah prayed for them and saying, the good Lord pardon everyone. That prepares his heart to seek God, the Lord God of his fathers, though he be not cleansed according to the purification of the sanctuary, not purified the way it had been written back there by Moses. He said, if they come and they have a prepared heart to seek God, that's a lesson that we learn from this. Verse 20, and the Lord hearkened unto Hezekiah. What's the next part? And healed the people. 25, and all the congregation of Judah with the priests and the Levites and all the congregation that came out of Israel and the strangers that came out of the land of Israel and that dwelled in Judah, rejoice. So there was great joy in Jerusalem, for since, for since the time of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, there was not the like in Jerusalem. What this is saying is they hadn't really kept the Passover and unleavened bread. That's a long time. Then the priests, the Levites, rose and blessed the people, and their voice was heard, and their prayer came up to his holy dwelling place, even unto heaven. Wow. Talk about a revival. Because see, here's the point in reading this. It's an incredible example of somebody that finally is trying to do it right. God reacts to us as we choose to please him, not to choose to please ourselves, i.e. sinning. So knowing this, as we keep these seven days of unleavened bread, with the mindset to humbly seek God, 
May every one of us throw out any spiritual leaven that we may identify in our lives during these seven days. And if we really are praying and asking God, show me things I've not seen, do you think God is going to ignore that? I don't think so. If we're doing it to seek the face of God, if we're doing it to please God, I think if we humble ourselves and do these things, I think God will do that. That's the example. That's the illustration that we see here. So we can throw out all of this, all of the spiritual leaven that we can see in our lives. Therefore, brethren, for these seven days of unleavened bread, may every one of us seek God's face. <clears throat> and as we just read, when we do that individually and as a congregation and as a church, then, we can be sure that our prayers will be heard in God's holy dwelling place in heaven. I believe that. And I claim that for all of us. Happy days of unleavened bread. God bless each one of you. And the ironic blessing kind of fits, doesn't it? And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron and to his son, saying, On this wise you shall bless the children of Israel, saying unto them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel, and I will bless them. God bless you all, brethren. God bless you all. We love you. God loves you more. Happy Holy Day. For our final hymn, if we could please rise and open our hymnals to page 51. We will sing, They Are Blessed Who Are Forgiven, and afterwards... The closing prayer will be brought to us today by Mr. Dennis Gerard, page number 51. Please remain standing for the closing prayer by Mr. Dennis Gerard. Father, we come before you now to ask your dismissal, your blessing upon the rest of our day and for the week that we are to undertake or to partake of the unleavened bread. We also ask that as we have a change in our society, as we are forced to endure the changes, 
that we might take that time and the opportunities to be an example to those around us as was exemplified today when Mr. Faulkner read the reading from the, uh, the sports hero, Terry Bollier, also known as Mr. Hogan. We can see there the example of Randy Rust, one of our members upon somebody that he knows and he works with. We never know how we might affect others. So help us to bear that in mind and not be focused so much on trying to just go through our lives and keep to ourselves, but rather to spread that good news to others. We never know what it might, how it might affect those other people and how they also might affect others. So we ask you to help us to bear this in mind as we endure these changes and, and help us to rejoice too. We're, we're, we're having the opportunity to see what the first century church had to go through themselves. And hopefully that'll help us to be more devout and more earnest and more sincere in how we keep your festivals and how we try to obey and worship you. We ask us all in Christ's holy name. Amen.